thank you guys for joining us. Um, just real quick, introduce our speakers for today. Uh, first off, you see myself, Dr. Brian Cornelius. Uh, I've been with Agerson for almost nine years now, uh, background in plant breeding um, and seed sales. Uh, now primarily responsible for a lot of the field research and some of the technical training uh, that we do at Agerson. And I'm joined today by one of my good friends and co-workers, Mr. Steve Sexton, who has uh, just years and years and years of experience, uh, over 20 years working with these biocatalyst technologies, as mm -hmm. well as experience on the farm. So Steve actually lived it uh, and now he's uh, working to try to provide a lot of technical assistance uh, to the guys in the field as well as the growers out there. Uh, working back from some of his experiences early on with the technologies and um, working in other parts of the world as well. Uh, spent time in Australia, now currently working a lot in, in Canada. So uh, I want to thank Steve for joining me this morning. Just a quick agenda. Basically, what we're trying to do this morning is uh, help you guys um, explore the opportunities and benefits of using extract uh, to influence the 2020 corn growing season. Uh, so uh, we know that extract, the technology has been proven over the years. And what we really want to do is make sure you guys have all the information you need uh, to utilize that technology in um, all of your um, corn growing situations for this season. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Steve Sexton and let Steve uh, kind of walk you through a quick review of some of the reasons why uh, the 2020 season is going to be so important. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Uh, today we're going to talk about fallow soil syndrome and our prevent uh, plant acres that were uh, not the exception this uh, this past year in 2019. They were the norm. And when you think of prevent plant acres, you think of, well, the Red River Valley in North Dakota and Minnesota. Uh, the Red River is one of two, uh, the two north flowing rivers in the United States, and it's typically flowing into a frozen region into Canada. Um, so it backs up. It's a low gradient river and it floods and they typically have prevent plant acres about one out of two years but even them even even that region they had 110,000 acres of sugar beets that didn't get harvested and thousands of acres of potatoes so the prevent plant acres extended from the spring to the fall all through the growing region so if you were to google fallow soil syndrome or fallow syndrome you would receive the following definition that you see. It's a phosphorus deficiency in the soil that results from reduction in the population of a particular fungi. They, they are called VAM mycorrhizae, or the acronym stands for vesicular or muscular mycorrhizae in the soil due to the absence of plants in the field the previous year. Another, uh, I, I, I like that another definition that I found is fallow soil syndrome is a phenomenon that occurs in fields or in areas of the field that suffer a collapse of the biological community that requires plant materials as a host due to flooding or lack of vegetative growth. The fallow syndrome revolves around the concept, and I've noticed that says concept, not proven fact of, of van mycorrhizae or mycorrhizae and their work in your soil. But when we talk about the collapse of the biological community, that's including all organisms, and we'll get into that in just a bit. But what are the symptoms that we see? And you, the, that picture that Dr. Brian uh, chose is, is really a good one because you see green spots in the field, and then you see fields that, parts of the field that are dead. It's because that we have little to no pea. Uh, we have purple coloration in the plants uh, because the soil microbes aren't processing our uh, uh, their biochemistry to solubilize phosphorus for plant seedling energy. And that's why we see the purple coloration and the short and stunted or uneven plants or no plants at all. And this problem is exacerbated where the soils were low in, in, in phosphorus to begin with, or they're just uh, cold, wet soils. Uh, <clears throat> they're 
from year to year in the spring. So as we look to the next slide, we, we see just how big of an impact the fallow soil syndrome had in 2019. There were 19.4 million acres with prevent plant. 22 states had more than 100,000 acres. Now I realize uh, the people along the, the Mississippi and along the Missouri, you know, they can flood every so often and there's acres there that uh, are prevent plant acres. They either produce really good crops or they get flooded out in the spring. Um, that's that's a normal flood cycle. But <clears throat> there were acres, I know of a branch in Illinois, Manlius, Bill Norton, he had 25,000 acres. He's, a, he's in Northern Illinois. He's not in an area that typically gets prevent plant. Now, Scott Campbell down at Pittsfield and Pleasant Hill, uh, Illinois, right along the a river, they they get flooded every once in a while, but he had um, thousands of acres in his, just in the people that he serviced that had prevent plant. But it stretched all through the corn belt, all through the cotton belt, all through our rice belt. It affected our dairy farms. I mean, it this was widespread. I don't know, hopefully we'll never see this again, but it was it was wet from the spring and on into the fall. So it's it's one of those years that we'll always remember. Now, when we, the purpose of this discussion today, we're focusing on corn, but Brian wanted to put this slide in just to show you it affected all of our crops and all of our farmers. There was 17 states that had greater than 100,000 acres of uh, prevent plant acres for corn. And, and all of your top 10 corn growing states are on this list. And even New York and North Dakota, uh, North Dakota has two to three million acres of corn now. And uh, when I flew in there uh, January the 6th of this year, you could see the patchwork quilt. There was a foot of snow on the ground and 60% of the corn was still standing, yet to be harvested. But this, this, this occurred all through the Corn Belt, all through the Southeast and the East on up into New York. And when you add up, uh, if you take an average of 170 bushels per acre, this added up to 1.9 billion bushels of corn that we did not cut. Now, people are say, well, with the prices today, that's good. We'll recover the, you know, we'll get, we'll get a price recovery faster without that, without that uh, in the system. But <clears throat> with the world population at um, 9 billion or, or 8.5 billion or, or wherever it is today, uh, this, could, this could lead to famine pretty quickly if that something like this happens in another uh, important cropping region. So this is, this is something not to be taken lightly. So what are our options with these fallow acres? What can we do um, to, to bring them back into production? Well, <clears throat> the options that science will list to you today, and they're, they're good suggestions, uh, cover crops. They do several things. Yes, they, they protect the soil from erosion, wind and, and water erosion they they cover the ground so they can suppress weed weed establishment weed growth um, by the by the uh, plants that are growing the cover crops growing that are secreting sugars into the soil they feed the microbes they help to improve the soil tilth and they also feed the vam mycorrhizae uh, that science says that we have to have to overcome fallow soil syndrome that's prevailing science thought we're going to get into another thought now, there, there's a very good suggestion. The reason uh, we talked about the, the pea deficiency, so it is highly suggested that a grower uses a starter fertilizer, uh, a phosphorus and zinc, like a riser or a black label zinc. Um, the higher rate should be put in a two by two because of the, of the salt. Uh, if you're using a 1034-0 and a pro zinc or a prologue, put it in the two by two. Uh, the riser can be placed in for OS, can the, the black label zinc. But we, sh but our growers should be using banding starter fertilizers. Now there are other alternative crops that are not that are more tolerant to fallow soil. Soybeans, of course, in the Corn Belt, that makes sense because that's uh, corn and soybeans are grown. It's not going to be feasible to grow sorghum up in Michigan and Minnesota and Wisconsin and 
northern Illinois or New York because uh, sorghum is a tropical crop and it needs heat. And as far north of, I've seen it grown as in, in Nebraska. So there are, soybeans are more tolerant to the fallow soil versus a corn. Now, <clears throat> the other prevailing thought is, or suggestion is to use a mycorrhizal inoculant in the soil at planting. Uh, these products, they can, they can work. Uh, the challenge we have with them is that they are a living product and they have to get established in that soil system to before they can secrete biochemistry to make phosphorus available. And they have to be in the presence of a living plant. And Brian and I are gonna show you data that just, just recently collected data that shows that the, the biochemistry from extract, which is the, the next suggestion, can work to release nutrients without a living plant. And it releases primarily phosphorus, but there's zinc and manganese and copper and boron and calcium and potassium that's being released as well. So this is what it's, what's exciting. We're on, we're on a cutting edge here. We're gonna change a paradigm. And, and um, Brian, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Yeah, Steve, and uh, on that last point, Steve mentioned the use of extract. So what I wanna do is kind of walk you guys through, extract the product, you know, what it is, what it does, and how it can be used as a tool in these prevent plant acres, as well as other acres where you're trying to get the most out of that acre, the most out of your fertility program to influence uh, the yields for this season. So let's walk through it. Just real quick, you know, extract is a tool for management of nutrients. And if you look at the description, it, you know, it's a proprietary blend of a fertilizer biocatalyst and ATS, unique to Loveland or slash nutrient, specifically formulated for broadcast sprays, residue management, UAN. And there are some key product benefits that are associated with the extract is to accelerate nutrient mineralization and recycling, improve uniformity and emergence of uh, in, in plant vigor, extend nutrient availability later into the season, improve total nutrient use efficiency. So that's kind of the, the quick what it is. And I was able to get a slide from uh, Scott Lay yesterday. Thanks to Scott for providing this to kind of show you guys the overall picture. You know, a lot of times we think of extract just for corn or corn going into beans, but it can be used in all of our situations. We've got information on potatoes and other crops. Uh, so this is just another, you know, visual of, of how you can position that extract, you know, corn, you know, what are your opportunities? You know, that UAN pre broadcast, I guess if that's a, you know, weed and feed, you know, with the pre herbicides and things like that. Uh, you look at soybeans, you know, really good opportunity in soybeans is that burn down or residual herbicide application. And then some guys have adopted uh, the UAN top dress and wheat. Uh, so that kind of gives you a, a better sense of, you know, how this technology can be spread across different crops. Um, but today we're talking about, you know, corn in particular. So again, what the extract is gonna provide for us. It's synergism between biochemistry and ATS. We know it's, you know, part accomplished LM biochemistry and ammonium thiosulfate, accelerated mineralization and release of nutrients. Again, whether it's nutrients we apply it with uh, or nutrients that are already in that system. Uh, Steve will go through some data with, you know, beef manure and things like that. A lot of guys are utilizing this in their uh, manure applications or litter applications. It's going to improve plant vigor you know, get that plant up out of the ground and growing. The longer it stays in the ground in that germination stage, the more vulnerable it gets to issues early in the season. And then again, increase in plant performance and yield. That's what we're after. We're trying to, you know, mitigate any of those uh, losses that might occur or those adverse conditions that could cause us some issues that might manifest later in the growing cycle that will reduce yield. We wanna to try to mitigate as much of that as possible using these tools. So this is a, a how it works a, in some sense when you're looking at using the extract product again. We're talking about corn today. So what you're seeing in this example is there is some corn residue 
on the surface, but we're also showing that this product is getting to the soil. You can imagine, you know, this example could be uh, manure, it could be litter, it could be any other situation out there. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to speed up the process to release those nutrients and make those nutrients more available to the plant and try to mitigate some of those immobilization, you know, mechanisms that will keep those nutrients where they're not available to the plant. And the way we do that is we're going to treat that system with the extract. Again, you, you saw some of those applications, you know, with the pre uh, herbicides, you know, the broadcast UAN, all of these other applications that we can use this uh, product in, we want to treat that system, whether it's residue on the surface or nutrients that are in the soil or it's litter, manure, compost, any of those other uh, organic sources that we're using, we want to take advantage of the extract to make those nutrients more available. You can see when we're not using those products, or not using the product in these situations, you don't get uh, the nutrient availability that you need and you don't get the maximum benefit uh, for your crop versus when we're actually applying that to the system and getting everything we can possibly get out of those, uh, out of the soil, out of those other organic nutrients that are being used to affect final yield. So Steve mentioned, you know, when we talk about the, the mycorrhizae and how they function, that there needs to be a plant in the system. They, they kind of work in concert with the plant roots. Well, what happens when there are no plants in that system, which is a perfect case for that 11.2 million acres of corn that did not get planted last year. If those growers are still determined to plant corn on those same acres, we have to deal with there not being any plants in that system because generally what the growers are going to do is they're going to try to control those weeds because they don't want the weeds robbing nutrients they don't want uh the weeds you know contributing more to the to the seed bank in the soil so generally they're going to try to control any vegetation on those acres so we looked at some of the fallow soils from the 2019 season we called up uh, a couple of guys in minnesota mike amundsen was one of those guys in dassel we got some soil from fairmont and what we asked is, that, hey, can you guys go out to a field that's uh, in these fallow acres that did not get planted, send us some soil, I think they sent us like a bucket of soil, five gallon bucket of soil, and we're going to do some tests with that. What we're going to do is we're going to divide those soils up into different samples. We sent five different samples in, but before we did that, we treated some of those soils or portion of those with extract and we didn't treat the other we just basically sprayed some water on those we let those we mixed those up really good we let those incubate uh for 24 to 48 hours and then we sent those soils into a lab for analysis and the chart you see in front of you is some of the results from that analysis you can see that you know we're looking at the difference in the nutrients or the increase uh, in the nutrients over the controls. And this is replicated, guys. We sent five replicates, five replicates in for each of these. So this is, you know, subject to statistics and we can do the averages here. But look at the differences in the phosphorus. You know, phosphorus is a big one. We saw uh, in Steve's portion of that presentation talking about some of the options that we have or some of the problems with, you know, that fallow syndrome is a, a reduction in the amount of phosphorus that's available. So look at the P1, the P2, and the Malik 3. Pretty consistent increases across all three of those. Our available phosphorus, our total or unavailable phosphorus, and then Malik 3, again, which is a different measure of uh, the amount of phosphorus in that system. All of those pretty consistent in the um, increase above the untreated with the extract. We saw some you know, smaller increases with potassium, calcium, magnesium, and boron, but then when we got out into some of the other micronutrients, man, it, it just really, really made a huge difference. Copper, iron, manganese, zinc. So guys, this is what we're talking about when we say extract can help in those soils because there's no plant in the system, but we still make nutrients more available, which is going to be key to overcoming that. So with that, 
I'm going to turn it back over to Steve and let Steve go through some other research that was done in 2019 that kind of backs up this same concept of more nutrient availability in soil health. Thank you, Dr. Brian. And uh, when we talk about fallow soil, we're talking about soil health. Fallow soil means it's poor soil health. Well, there's a group of scientists and agronomists in the Northern High Plains Division that uh, designed a trial to examine closely how extract impacts soil health. Uh, the study was conducted at the Grant um, in Grant, Nebraska at the Stump Research Facility in conjunction with the University of Nebraska Extension Center. There were four randomized replications. Uh, the beginning soil test was taken April 19th uh, when the extract was applied. And then soil tests were taken every two weeks and uh, for four months. And then that ended on September the 3rd. Now again, What's key here, just like in Dr. Brian's slides in Minnesota, the soils, there's no growing plant here. So this, this team you know, uh, consisted of Christine Chitwood and Mark Fabricius and Chad Hodson and Alex Meisner and Slater Chandler. I give them kudos, uh, Brian, Dr. Brian and I give them kudos because they are trying to better define soil health and how the biochemistry can impact that soil health even when there's no growing plants. So they took these soil tests, they took an average of them, and what we, you see on the next slide is an average increase of nitrate nitrogen at zero to eight inches deep. We see a six to 16% increase. Nitrate nitrogen in pounds per acre at eight to 24 inches, we see a 20 to, I'm sorry, my, my um, I'm using, my bad math again, uh, at zero to eight inches, it was 11 to 17% increase. At z eight to 24 inches deep, it was 20 to 22 inches, 20 to 22% increase. When we look at the Bray-1 phosphorus, or what uh, Dr. Brian and I like to refer to as checking account phosphorus, it's plant available. We saw almost a 10% in the Bray-1 phosphorus. In the Bray-2 phosphorus, we saw of five to six percent. And notice there are three treatments here. There was untreated, uh, one gallon per acre of extract, two gallon per acre of extract. There was a three gallon per acre uh, treatment, but uh, that's not economically feasible. So uh, we carved that one off. But in most of the data that you're going to see, the one gallon rate performs on par with the two gallon. And sometimes it's just a little bit above it. So uh, while we don't push the two gallon rate, uh, the one gallon rate really performs at an optimal level to release the nutrients in that soil chemistry. On the next slide, it examines uh, the inorganic forms of nitrogen that plants use. What converts our nutrients, our nitrogen, or organic nitrogen into an inorganic plant available form? Well, it's biochemistry, the active ingredient in extract. On the nitrate nitrogen, we see a six to 16% uh, increase. Now, this is one instance where the, the two gallon rate outperformed the one gallon rate, but on the ammonium nitrogen, the first stage of inorganic nitrogen from organic nitrogen uh, is, is mineralized into ammonium NH4 plus, uh, we, we see a, a 15 to 23% increase in ammonium nitrogen. As far as the phosphate on our orthophosphate, remember the, the plant uses hydrogen phosphate. It doesn't use uh, calcium phosphate or magnesium phosphate, but uh, we see a four to 8% increase with the extract on our orthophosphate. And on our total P, it's a five to 6% increase. And again, uh, these fields did have a manure history. So there was manure there. And, and, and one of the common feedbacks is, well, I've got enough microbes in the manure. I don't need I don't need to put anything else out. Well, this is a perfect example. Manure is good. Chicken litter is good. All carbon sources are inherently good long term. But what happens in colder soils with microbes? They don't secrete any biochemistry to to process the nutrients. So while that this these fields were this field this research farm was manured 
these are randomized blocks we're looking at, replications, it shows you the power of the biochemistry to release the nutrients, because remember, they started taking soil samples in April. So it's when the soils were colder and there was very little microbial activity. Then on the last slide, um, they, we look at the inorganic nitrogen credit, 12 to 15% increase for the extract uh, treatments, and on the potentially mineralizable nitrogen. There's a little bit of an anomaly here, and I think Dr. Bryan can speak to it on the, when he comes up next. You see the, the, the potentially mineralizable nitrogen drop off for the two gallon rate. I think that may be from the ATS that's in the extract. Uh, the one gallon rate though, increased the potentially mineralizable nitrogen by 22%. What's that potentially mineralizable nitrogen? Well, in the fraction of the soil that we call humus, uh, it's, it's residue in various stages of decomposition. Scientists now call it labile carbon or active carbon portion of our soil. When we do our soil tests uh, and you see the nitrate or the pounds per acre that's available after you take the soil test, when I was farming, we always took the soil test in the fall to, to see what we had to develop our fertilizer programs for the spring. I always assumed and this is 30 years ago now that, that that available nitrogen was from nitrogen that we didn't we didn't use. But today we know through science that nitrogen that's available in our soil tests is coming from biochemistry that's that's converting the the inner the organic nitrogen in that labile carbon or that humus fraction into that inorganic available nitrogen. And so I give kudos to the science team from the Northern High Plains Division because they're taking it upon themselves to try to uh, define soil health and what's going on in the soil when a plant isn't growing. And this, this trial here uh, speaks volumes. Dr. Bryan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it back over to you now. All right, thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, so let's, let's go east quite a bit from over there in the Northern High Plains Division over to Illinois and look at some more university research that shows the benefits of adding extract to the system. So uh, this is work from Dr. Belo's group at the University of Illinois. And many of you are familiar with Dr. Belo, his uh, Seven Wonders of the Corn Yield World and his Six Secrets of Soybean Success. Uh, but we've been working with Dr. Belo's group uh, on various projects since 2011, 2012, and we've continued to do work with him. And now the work that we're doing focuses on extract and a lot of his continuous corn and corn uh, soybean rotations. And the information I'm going to show you over the next few slides just gives you a better sense of what we're seeing with the extract as a management tool in our corn system. So the first slide here, this is uh, data from Allison Vogel's research under Dr. Belo, where she was looking at this continuous corn yield penalty and ways to help mitigate that continuous corn yield penalty in different uh, systems, a standard corn head system that leaves more residue on the surface that's unsized versus a, chop, a chopping corn header that resizes that residue. And they looked at an untreated system, extract as one treatment, and then looked at ammonium sulfate as just a straight nitrogen treatment because that is or has been uh, one way to manage residue is to add some nitrogen after harvest. And the mechanism behind that is what you're trying to do is add nitrogen to help balance the carbon. It's all about balancing the carbon to nitrogen ratio in that system. So uh, we use. Uh, ammonium sulfate as the nitrogen source, which gives you nitrogen and sulfur as well as you get nitrogen and sulfur in the extract. So look at the yields here. Uh, there, there's a lot of other data that goes along with this study. Uh, they measured uh, decomposition and other things like that, but we're gonna focus on the yield today. And you look in that standard system, untreated 175 bushels, the extract treatment, 192 bushels versus ammonium sulfate, uh, 181. So really nice increase uh, with the extract in the standard system 
Now let's go over to the chop system. So all we did in this is resized um, the residue with the chopping head and in the untreated gained a little bit of uh, yield, six bushels in the untreated. Uh, but look at the difference between the untreated and the extract uh, in the chop system, again, versus the ammonium sulfate where we only gained uh, a few bushels over the untreated with the AMS. So guys, just another example of how we can use the extract system to manage the nutrients uh, in different uh, corn systems. 2019, let's look at uh, University of Illinois, again, an extension of this study. And in 2019, it was taken over by Connor Seibel. Allison uh, graduated and moved on. Uh, so now Connor is managing the research. We're already planning the 2020 season. So in the continuous corn, look at the untreated 204 bushels. We gained another five bushels with the extract. Yields weren't, the differences weren't as big as 2018, but still consistent over the untreated versus the ammonium sulfate down at 192 bushels, actually significantly less than uh, the untreated and the extract treatment. But look at what happened when they combined extract with the ammonium sulfate. It didn't out yield the extract treatment alone, but it significantly improved uh, over the ammonium sulfate. So that was in the continuous corn. Now let's look at the corn soybean rotation. Again, same treatments, untreated 213, we gained Another five bushels, pretty consistent. Uh, with the extract, no difference uh, with the ammonium sulfate. But again, look at that combination of the ammonium sulfate and the extract. Here, it looks like there is some, some synergy in the corn-soybean rotation uh, with those two technologies combined. So just wanted to walk you through, like Steve, walk you through the work in the Northern High Plains in conjunction with uh, Christine, Mark, <clears throat> Chad, Alex, and Chandler. And then we go to some other university research at Illinois. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Steve to show you some of the things that are coming from the field. Some of the things that we're seeing on our growers farms that are using these technologies in different places. So here you go, Steve. Uh, pictures speak volumes. Pictures speak louder than words. This is a corn on corn system in Edgar, Nebraska. Rodney Knutson is the branch manager there. And we can see in the left-hand side of the picture, this picture was taken in August, that corn is running out of nitrogen. It's starting to cannibalize itself. The lower leaves are firing. It's a corn on corn system. In the right-hand side of the picture where they applied the extract in that part of the field, those the soil health and plant health uh, the, those plants are not lacking for nitrogen. They're deep green color. There was about a 15 bushel yield increase uh, for the extract in, in that particular um, field trial. On the next slide, uh, <clears throat> we have Mike Evans, and he's a division, division agronomist for the Western Iowa division. Uh, and he did a trial with beef manure. The grower used 20 tons. Extract was put out at a gallon per acre uh, with the pre-emerge. Uh, typically, I think Brian and I, Brian will tell you also that with 20 ton of manure, we probably expect closer to 15 bushel. Mike got a 10 bushel yield increase. The grower was happy. That's still a good ROI to our growers, even with the, the lower corn prices we have today. Um, so it's, and, and that was 10 bushels he wasn't going to get without the extract. On the next slide, Mike's customer added the, the extract to a liquid solution, a liquid solution of P and K. Now, this is what a lot of the, the Northern High Plains and the Southern High Plains and the South Plains where John Quillen is with the, the cotton and uh, Chad Hodgson and John Dusing and Matt Burdick, they're using in Nebraska and uh, Northern High Plains and Southern High Plains, they're putting extract in liquid blends. In this case, it led to 11 bushel yield increase. The point is here with all the negativity in agriculture right now, I believe that the, the sun's getting ready to shine. I think that when we get demand going again, we're gonna see a price rebound. 
But even today, there was a report put out that, that dry fertilizer, uh, the nitrogen portion, is at the lowest it's been in 10 years. Potassium's leveled off. Uh, phosphate's leveled off. But uh, a 180-77 blend is $20 cheaper, lower cost this year than it was last year. If a grower has a fertilizer budget, and we all know they have a budget, and we have to be very cognizant of that budget and very respectful, they could still input extract into their fertilizer program for this year and still let, spend less money per acre than they spent last year, and they're going to get the increase in yield. That's the bottom line is, is uh, increased profitability. All right, thanks, I'll Steve. I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Yep. All right, so, so what I want to do this last data slide is just kind of give you guys a sense of what we're seeing when we start to combine all of this information together. We went back and, and we had this piano graph of extract data on multiple crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, you know, potatoes and things like that. So what we did is carved out just the observations for extract on corn. And we ended up with 40 observations. I think we started with 86 uh, on the total data set. And we took the 40 corn observations out of that. And we can see very consistently in some of the data that you just saw across those 40 observations, it's a 10 bushel increase on corn uh, with extract. And, and guys, yes, there are a few treatments there on that graph that did not uh, pan out for some reason. We're not trying to hide those. We just want to make sure you guys see that when you average this across multiple data points, and you can see that the majority of these are, are very positive and a very good return on investment, extract does offer the ability to help increase yield, productivity, plant health, all of these things as we look to uh, get going with the 2020 planting season. So again, let's summarize what we've gone through. Uh, again, the effects of the fallow syndrome are more than likely going to manifest themselves in this 2020 growing season. Remember, we had over 11 million acres of corn and that did not get planted in the 2019 season. Uh, extract can be used to counter the effects of fallow syndrome. Uh, this spring, along with other cultural practices, remember those other things that uh, Steve mentioned, you know, the start of fertilizers. In some cases, guys may want to inoculate uh, with mycorrhizae, things like that. You know, Steve gave you some options uh, from the, the nutrient portfolio, the riser, there's Levitate, there's Black Label Zinc, there's Prologue, there's all kinds of options if you're going to go that route of adding uh, some uh, nutrients to that starter blend or some technologies to enhance uh, the availability of nutrients in that. You saw the recent trials that support extract uh, for increased nutrient availability, improved plant and soil health. And then we're continuing to uh, build that data set that shows extract has utility for every corn acre. There's there's lots of information out there. Guys, if you have information that you want to share and, and allow us to add to the database, just reach out to Steve or myself or anyone on the Agerson team. We'd be more than happy uh, to take that information and add it to the database so everyone, when we share this information, has the most up-to-date and the most data possible uh, to uh, show the advantages of these technologies. 